Good evening. Glad we could all be here tonight. Uh, we have uh, just a great time uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to have a great time looking at uh, just a further concept of the person of Jesus Christ and how God has reconciled all things to himself through him and uh, how he truly was fully human and fully God. And so I look forward to uh, sharing some, some things about that subject with you. That's a, a very, very profound and uh, involved subject uh, in Scripture. But uh, this, this evening we're going to be looking at uh, specifically Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, uh, which is, I think, the highlight of that particular letter. And uh, we're going to learn a lot about that. So I just, uh, I, I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. It's been a wonderful meditation. With that said, let's go ahead and pray and, and get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, we have a lot to look into tonight, and we ask that your spirit would grant us the grace to understand uh, these concepts and these truths, that we would be able to uh, handle the scriptures uh, faithfully, and that we would seek to know your intent behind what is said, that it may inform us of not only who you are, but what you have done through the person of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege of doing so because of Jesus and the fact that we are your children. We love you and we thank you and we ask that this uh, evening would be a time reserved for us to learn, for us to appreciate and express gratitude for all that you've done for us through the cross of Christ. We love you, we thank you, we praise you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 209 is our first song tonight. 209, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing this. Page 208, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Okay. 
be seated. Our uh, prayer focus for this week, a uh, missionary is Dave Pennington, uh, serving up in Machias, uh, Down East Baptist Church in Maine, Dave and Pindy, Cindy Pennington. The, he was a pastor here for a while, uh, moved away, but uh, now he's back. Well, he's been there a couple years, I guess. Uh, just trying to reestablish that church up in Machias. I guess they started out with few in number, but they're up to around 30 now. So we're going to pray for him. Uh, our local pastor is Tim Lewis down in New Hampshire, uh, New England Shores Baptist in Hampton, New Hampshire. And we'll pray for that ministry. And uh, we'll pray for our government official, uh, Trey Stewart, our, the Senate Minority Leader. Uh, so let's look to the Lord now in time of prayer. <coughs> Father in heaven, we do uh, come before thee, uh, thankful hearts for who you are. God of uh, all-knowing, all-powerful, Father, that you hear, uh, hear and answer our prayers. Lord, we lift up uh, Dave and Cindy Pennington uh, up there in uh, uh, Down East Baptist Church. We pray for that ministry. We pray that uh, it, would, it would grow not only in numbers, but also just in uh, close to thee and, and serving thee. We pray for uh, Dave, that you would just give him wisdom, power, and his preaching. Lord, we thank thee for the growth that uh, we've seen there. We just ask that you would continue to uh, work in that, uh, that ministry, that it would, it would uh, bring honor and glory to you. We pray that the, uh, that church family, the, uh, those that attend, we pray that they would, they would grow, and they would uh, grow close to thee, and they would serve thee. We, we pray also for Tim Lewis and the uh, uh, New England Shores Baptist Church there in Hampton, New Hampshire. Uh, I remember that we had at one time had, uh, had them on our missionary uh, list that, as uh, supporting them, and now they're, they're uh, self-sufficient. We uh, thank thee for that ministry there for Tim and his labor. We ask you, uh, likewise, that you would bless that ministry and that you would uh, help it to grow. We pray for Tim, give him uh, power in his preaching. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, the outreach of that church would, uh, would honor thee, that uh, souls would be saved, the, the uh, surrounding community, they would be reached with the gospel. <coughs> Father, also, we I want to pray for uh, Trey Stewart and our uh, minority leader in our Senate. Father, we pray for, for him and, and for our, our government officials. And Lord, we, uh, one, we, we pray that, uh, that they might come to know thee as Lord and Savior. Uh, Father, those that are maybe close to them might know thee. We pray for their influence on them. But Lord, we, we ask that as the, uh, he serves thee in, in this capacity in our local government, we pray that you would give him wisdom uh, help him to make the right decisions, that, those that would uh, be in line with, with your word and your, uh, your commandments. Uh, Father, we ask that, uh, that through him that uh, uh, proper uh, procedures might, might take place, and Lord, that we would benefit from, from having him there. So, Lord, again, we thank thee for this time to come before thee, and we pray that you would minister in the hearts of these uh, three individuals and use them to thine honor and glory. For this we thank thee and praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Two hundred and thirty-two is our next hymn. Two thirty-two. Away in a manger. Let's stand together as we sing. Jesus. 
If you'd please open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at a very familiar passage this evening. Uh, It's very important for us to recognize the role of this passage, and I'm going to uh, bring out some, um, some facts about church history to help you understand the importance of the statements that we find in Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to go ahead and read from verse 15 to verse 20. The word of God says, who is the image of the invisible God, referring to Christ as Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him we are were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Heavenly Father, bless our time in your word this evening. I pray that you'd help us to uh, clearly understand what you're saying here. More importantly, I pray that you'd help us to apply it to our lives, that we'd clearly understand not only what is said, but the importance of it, that we might be better equipped to serve you and to honor you as God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was preparing for this morning's message, I went into um, just one of my old systematic theology books, and uh, I was reminded of the absolute mess the church was when it came to the teaching of the person and nature of Christ in the first four centuries, and, and then all of the heresies that exist today that were based on some of the ideas that were proposed in the first four centuries of the history of Christianity. So it's interesting how this is something that was already evident in the first century when Christianity was just beginning. If you look at Colossians and what what Paul is doing in the book of Colossians, he's actually trying to present truth about Jesus Christ and who he was. And, And verses 15 through 20 are foundational for this particular letter because they are the verses that communicate truths that will be depended on to make arguments later on against false teachings and false teachers. And so if, if you understand Colossians as an apologetic against the false, false teachings about who Jesus is, you'll find that these verses are central. And so we're going to use these to understand essentially, well, not only as we, we highlight what the problems have been in church history, we're going to understand how the Bible addresses these issues. And so let's, let's look at a little bit of church history. There are two main philosophies that have driven men, whether well-intending men or men who are just not interested in the truth at all, uh, two main philosophies that have driven men in, over the edge as far as when it comes to the borders, the boundaries that the Bible presents for us when it comes to defining who Jesus is. One of them is Jewish monotheism. And that is uh, something that we have to keep in mind, that remember the Shema and how it's it's very clear. Israel, you have one God, and so it has to be the Father. How can there be another God, the Son, and another God, the Holy Spirit? How can there be a triune God if there is only one God? And, And this is something that we can address at another time, but the Bible explicitly says that there are three persons, all of them being equally God and being in perfect unity, right? It does not, just because they're in perfect unity does not mean that they're 
any less three individual persons or the three distinct persons and at the same time them being in perfect unity and having the same essence uh, makes them one and so we can still claim monotheism as Christians uh, having three persons and one essential God nature. The second uh, ideology was one that Paul was uh, working with or in the context of, and that was the Greek dualism of the day. And so if you're familiar with um, the philosophers that were around and writing even before uh, Paul was uh, going on his missions, uh, we think of Plato and so on and so forth, you'll find that there was a, a, a dualism that existed uh, where Anything physical or material was evil, and everything that was good was all spiritual. So if you're material, you're bad. Spiritual, you're good, which means that no one can be good, right? How do you, how do you figure that one out? You have to actually do away with your physical attachments and the, your attachment to the physical world to actually come to a state of pure goodness. And that in and of itself led to all kinds of things uh, having to deal with um, just their, their view of life in general. With that said, though, this kind of thinking had an influence on Christianity, not only in the first century, but also in the centuries to follow. We've heard of Gnosticism. Have you, have you not heard of Gnosticism? Well, Gnosticism is essentially Greek dualism with a Christian verbiage. You know, it's saying, well, of course... If it's physical, it's bad, and, and so we need to reach this higher knowledge to be able to transcend the physical realm and, and have this great insight into the goodness of the spiritual realm, and that's how we achieve and arrive at our unique standing. And those are oversimplifications. We're not going to go into Gnosticism tonight. But I would say that if we, if we keep that in mind, um, there, you're, you're going to understand why this was such a big deal. Who is Jesus Christ? And why is it that he was able to minister to us effectively as the Bible says? Can we deny his deity and still claim his cross? Can we deny his humanity and still call him our savior? I would submit to you that the answer to those questions is both one and the same. No, we can neither deny the deity of Christ nor his full humanity because it is that which has answered the plight of man. So give you a, a quick rundown of what was happening in the first four centuries of Christianity. You had the, you know, people who denied the deity of Christ. Um, here, here's, here's how the Ebionites put it. They, they said that Jesus was qualified as the Messiah at his baptism. And so many of these different schools of thought said, you know, it wasn't until he was baptized where the Holy Spirit actually came down. And there are several, several uh, uh, groups that teach this, that, that Jesus was just an, uh, a normal man until God began to work with him or in him after his baptism. Uh, that he was born as a natural human being. So um, the Allegoi denied that uh, Christ was God. He was, he, they say he was born miraculously through the Virgin Mary denied the writings of John because they believed it contradicted the teachings regarding the Logos, which, you know, John begins his uh, a gospel with the Logos and declaring who the Logos was. <clears throat> but they also taught that Christ descended upon Jesus at baptism, giving him supernatural power. So he was, he was not really God. He was just a superhuman being. You, you're going to see um, a group of people called monarchians, and there are different kinds of monarchians. Uh, if you've studied church history, um, 
There's a man named Paul of Samosota who, who fit under the dynamic monarchians, and they distinguished between the man Jesus and the Logos. The man Jesus was born of Mary. The Logos was an impersonal divine reason that took up its abode in Christ as preeminent sense from the time of his baptism, qualifying from his work, and generally speaking, the people who believe that, that the divine came upon Jesus during his baptism also believe that it left him right before the cross. And so just to give you an idea of how Jewish monotheism influenced the thinking about Jesus and who he was in the first four centuries. Greek dualism had um, also a, a, a tremendous influence, an unfortunate influence. Um, told you about the monarchians. There were modalistic monarchians. There's, there's an actual heresy out there today called modalism. How, how, how many of you have heard of modalism? Modalism? Okay. Modalism is basically saying that um, there's one God that he has appeared in different forms. And so Jesus was a manifestation of God insofar as, you know, he, he was God. At that time period, he was the only God as the Son. And then he can also act as the spirit and then he can also be the father as well but it's not three persons it's really one person in different forms one of the one of the clearest um, examples of this uh, is when people use for example the the uh, the illustration of water in its three states it's always water and so water can be ice it can be uh, steam or gas or it could be liquid and so the three states of water give us a sense of you know the the three persons of god there's still one essence and as well meaning as well intending as that illustration is one of the challenges and one of the things you have to be very clear about is that each person of the deity is is their own person and they all exist equally at the same time okay you can't say that jesus is jesus one day and then the father the next day and the holy spirit another day Okay. And this is where people misunderstand. And in doing so, what you're doing is you're denying the full humanity of Christ. Okay, And that's exactly what they did. And Unfortunately, those people that tried to defend uh, Jesus and his nature also committed errors. And we have to be very careful. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, I, I never fault a man for trying his best to to reason through things, especially when there are new things that, that have come up. Uh, and and I, I give a lot of grace when wrestling, because there are some things that come out that you're like, wow, where did they come up with this stuff? But it, when you think about it, it's that these are well-intending men trying to explain, what, infinite concepts, right? Eternal concepts from a finite perspective. And so it's it's a good thing that we have collectively the church to to review these things to think through these things to push back a little bit where some things need to be pushed back and, and a lot of these issues that came up in the first four centuries we we had the council of nicaea which was the first declaration of the fact that jesus was one person with two natures he was fully human and fully god and that happened around 321 A.D. Uh, so you can see already in, it, it, took, it took the church up to the 4th century to come to this consensus and make a formal declaration of who they believed Jesus was. It didn't settle the issue. Um, you had uh, different people trying to explain this concept and doing things that unfortunately were, um, how can I put this, uh, damaging to that particular understanding of the doctrine, of that particular doctrine. For example, Apollinarius attempted to offer an answer to the question of the relationship between one person of Christ having two natures. And so what, what did he do? He, he tried to secure the unity of the person of Christ without sacrificing his deity or, or his sinless nature, but he did so at the expense of his humanity. Why? Well, he was greatly influenced by the Greek concept of man and the trichotomy of man. So body, soul, and spirit, right? 
That's how there was a Greek view of man. And so he believed that the Logos took, this, took the, the place of the Spirit. So there, again, an external divine influence that, that took over a part of his humanity. And he, so he was no longer fully human. And so uh, there are others, for example, uh, Arianism. Arianism denied the full humanity or the full deity of Christ, saying, well, you know, he's, he's a really great human being, but he's not really fully God. Do you know that Arianism is still alive and well today? Can you tell me of, of a group of people that hold to Arian, Arian teachings? Jehovah's Witnesses, right, exactly. They're one of several. They're not the only. And so to think that these ideas have died or gone away is, is, is not accurate. Uh, we have um, other isms that are out there, and, and we could go into them if you'd like at some point over coffee, but not tonight for sake of time. Uh, but there were men, well-meaning men, who, who, again, denied that Christ was one person with two natures, and their teachings would either deny or, or, or try to reconcile those things at the expense of his humanity or, or the unity of his person or um, at the, the expense of him having two natures. And so the question is, um, you have the, con the Council of Nicaea, which took the stand, one person, two natures, that was further uh, emphasized and, and, and accentuated by the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and again by the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. And there, every time a new idea pops up, the churches in the first five centuries here you see come together, they discuss the issues, they look into the scripture, and they come out with the same conclusion over and over again, Jesus is fully God and fully man existing in one person. So how do they do that? Well, we won't go into the full theological background of this, but we're going to look at a passage where Paul wrote to a church addressing this very issue, addressing all of the errors that were you know, popping up that brought into question how to not only live the Christian life, but what does it mean to be a Christian? How, how is it that we're to live in light of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ? And at the very foundation of that argument is the, you know, the answer to the question, well, who is Jesus Christ? Because that is going to help us understand what he has accomplished. So we're going to see in verses 15 through 20 that there is a definite person who is very much God. And yet, we're also going to see expressions that can only be attributed to a human being. And that God was working through uh, his humanity to accomplish a very, very special thing that we have cause to rejoice and cause to be grateful and most importantly, great reason to hope that we have a glorious future ahead of us. And so if you look with me at um, verse 13 of chapter 1, let's get a running start into this passage. Uh, you're going to see that in verse 13, the, the who there is talking about the Father in verse 12, right? who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through the, his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And so I want you to see that the first thing we're, we're looking at is the fact that it's the father working through the son to bring us this redemption, which is also called the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful way to start a letter? Hey, by the way, we, our sins have been forgiven if we trust in Christ. 
right? And, and th- this is the gospel in a nutshell where Paul is trying to bring attention to. This is the Father's work. Just like we saw this morning, right? It's the Father who's initiated. The Father sent the Son. The Father sent the Spirit. And it's the Father's initiative that is being emphasized in these passages of Scripture when it comes to what is happening uh, in, in God's economy through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 15, when you see that word who, that's referring not to the Father now, but to the Son, right? Because it's, it's his kingdom that we've been translated into, the kingdom of his dear son, in whom, and there, there you go, it's, it's in Christ and the dear son that we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then now it's going to tell us about who this person is. The first thing that it tells us, we're going to see, uh, we have two statements in verse 15, followed by an explanation in verses 16 and 17. The first statement that we have in verse 15 is, who is the image of the invisible God? That word image there is the same word that we derive the word icon from. Okay, So if you know what an icon is, it's a symbol, right? It's a symbol that tells us, hey, this is, this is standing for something. Well, this is one of the meanings that uh, the Greek uh, community would have used for this word, but there's also uh, a more appropriate definition for this particular context, and that is that this is a representative. It is the very nature of the thing being represented. It is just like what is being represented. And so here we have as the the beloved son, the dear son, right, who is who's brought redemption through his blood, by the way, uh, no Greek person would have ever considered that a spirit would have been able to bleed. All right? And no Jewish person would deny that there's a human life in the blood. Life is in the blood. That's, a, that's an Old Testament standard. And so it, from the Jewish monotheistic concept, we have here's the beloved son who died. And from the Greek perspective, now we're dealing with, okay, we're dealing with a material, a, a physical person, not just some spiritual existence. Okay? And, and that is who is the icon of the invisible God. So here we have the concept that it's Jesus who has given us a clear presentation of who God is. And we know from other places in Scripture, John chapter 1, for example, that he is the perfect expression. Hebrews chapter 1, he is, you know, the... the the radiance of his glory, it says in, in Hebrews chapter 1, right? And so it, it, it is pointing to the fact, and Paul is making a statement here. He's, he's not being apologetic about it. He's just making a, a, a factual statement where he's saying that this son is the perfect representation of the God we can't see. And so if you want to know God, you can't see him, but you can see his son who is just like him in every way. Why can you see him? Well, he's, he's standing before you as a human being. Notice how it says the firstborn of every creature. Now, I remember it must have been just a few weeks after Marisha and I got saved so we had this elderly gentleman, and he was a nice gentleman. He was a very kind soul. He would come to our door, knocked on the door, and he wanted to show us something from the Bible. And being relatively new converts, we were like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, come on in, sit down. I had no clue that this man was a Jehovah's Witness or what he was about to tell us. But he proceeded to try to convince Marisha and I that Jesus was a created being. And he was using this passage of scripture to prove it. Right? Because he's the firstborn. Of course, he, he, is, he is very special. He is the prototype, right? No. 
No, no. See, this this concept of firstborn is something that is very Jewish in nature. In fact, if you turn to Psalm 89, verse 27, you'll find that and, and there's a, a firstborn among all kings, and in verse 20, it's actually referring to David as being the firstborn among all kings of the earth. Was David the first king to ever exist? Does the, does the Bible lie? Well, there must be something else then, isn't there? I would submit to you that this passage, and we're going to see how this thought is developed, but this passage uses the word firstborn to talk about the preeminence of Christ. What does that mean? It means he is top dog. He is, he is not just a leader among peers. He is the one who deserves uh, all, our, our, all of our respect, all of our honor. He is the one who is truly uh, standing above and beyond every other creature. And so the question is, why? That would be the natural question. Why is this, this representative of, of the invisible God considered the preeminent person over all, cre- all creatures? Notice how it says every creature. That means every single creature. Well, what's the first word in verse 16? For, right? Right? This explains it. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, let me ask you a question. Is all things all things? So how can he be the creator of all things and yet still be a created being? I would have loved to ask that gentleman that question. I was still in shock. It's like, what are you trying to tell me here? That's, that's, not, that's not what I, I've learned. I mean, everywhere else in the Bible, Jesus is God and he's pre-existing and now you're telling me he's a creature. No, that doesn't, make, that doesn't sound right. I want you to put yourself in, in those shoes. I've been there. It's uncomfortable when people tell you things that you just don't know. It seems at the surface to make sense. But if you just pay attention to what God has revealed, notice how he explains things very clearly. You can't have Christ being part of creation and yet at the same time being responsible for all of creation. It's just not possible. And so either the Bible is true and Arianism and those religions based on this idea of the person of Christ are false. Or we might as well just toss everything out the window because not even their religion, which is based on what they think the Bible says, um, can be trusted. And so Jesus is clearly being portrayed here as the first cause of all things. That's exactly what it's, going, what it's saying here. Notice, notice how this is stated because this is very important. I want you to see this. Notice how it starts with all things were, were created, all things. For by him all things were created that are where? In heaven and then earth, visible and then invisible. Okay? So this is a grammatical construction It's called a chiasm. You see that in the middle is earth and what's visible. And in the in the exterior of that, if you if you think of it this way, heaven and invisible. All right. Why is that important? And that's important because it tells you that this this segment is a a self-standing declaration of the extent of what was created. Basically, all things means everything, heaven and earth, everything that you see, everything that you can't see. This is, this is uh, something that is truly uh, reiterating the concept of all things, right? And so there's nothing in heaven or on earth 
the spiritual realm or the physical realm that was not created by the person of Jesus Christ. And that's further emphasized when we look at um, how it goes on to say whether they be thrones or dominions. Have you ever wondered where government comes from? Well, if you've read Romans chapter 13, you know that God has appointed government. It's one of the three human institutions that God has ordained, right? Government comes from God. And notice how it goes on to say principalities or powers. We know from uh, chapter 2 of Colossians and, and the rest of the book that there are a lot of, of spiritual powers referred to, both demonic and otherwise, and even these are under the purview of creation. There's no angel in heaven who has not been created. Think about this for a moment. Everything, everything except God is a creature and is part of creation. Right? And so when we look at Jesus Christ, this statement, what it says is he is outside of creation, making all things, right? The idea of him creating we're seeing as an expression of his intellectual capacity that he designed all things, right? And, and sometimes just looking at the way some things that we take for granted uh, are, are, are constructed and brought together make us realize that this is not an accident. This is actually designed. You know, I've used cilia and bacteria to show that that's designed. Any, any part of that specific appendage of a bacteria, if, if any part of that did not exist, none of it would and neither would that life form. So there's no possibility of evolution when it comes to certain things. It also talks about his power, does it not? Not only was he capable of designing all of this, but he actually brought it into existence. And so when we look at this, we see that everything was created by him. But I think that the end of the verse is all equally important, if not even more important. And for him. One of the commentators that I was reading, and the commentaries I was reading was saying, you know, when you look at a, a work of art, let's say a statue, you, you recognize, I think it's, it's one of the amazing things about statues, for example, is you recognize that this was a raw piece of stone and the artist perceived in his mind an image that he wanted to create. And then he went about the business of creating that. And then we sit back and appreciate that artist's work. And we, for example, do not attribute Michelangelo's David to anyone else but Michelangelo. Michelangelo is a master artist. He's a master sculptor. Well, look at the result of his technique, of his discipline, of his knowledge. Look at how he brought forth out of this raw stone, which, which by the way, if you listen to historians, that was supposed to be a junk stone, and he turned it into something marvelous. And who do we give credit and who are we in awe of when it comes to that particular work of art? The artist. How much more should we be in awe of the creator of all things? Remember, this is talking about the sun. And so when we see that all things were created by him and for him, what Paul is saying is that, look, when we look at everything that he has done, it should all point to his magnificent glory. 
And what a joy it is to be able to recognize that that's the same God who created me. So I may kid around that I'm going to be taller and handsomer in heaven. But that's not because of the lack of craftsmanship that God put into me. That's simply just because of my own, well, sinful nature. It is a joke. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that uh, when we look at what Paul is saying, is it's very clear Jesus is uh, the image of the invisible God because he is God, and he is one who represents God in his fullness. And even before the world began, he already had in his mind exactly what he was going to do as far as the creative power that he was going to exercise and just how he was going to do it to bring about the physical world. Which means that he himself can't be part of it. And so this, this morning we heard a statement saying that he was born of a woman, which meant he was fully human. This, this evening we're seeing how, how Paul is pointing out the fact that he is the first cause of all creation and therefore cannot be exclusively a creature himself. So he must have two natures. He must be equal with God in every way, preexistent, omnipotent, omniscient, ever-present. Just like God in every one of God's perfections. And yet... we're going to see that he is very much part of his creation as well. In verse 17, we see he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Uh, in in um, verse 15, the firstborn, we're talking about preeminence. Here we are actually talking about uh, he is before all things, meaning that he was preexistent before anything was created. And... Not only that, but have you thought about that? This is something that astounds me every time I think about it. But that he actually is not just the creator, he's also the sustainer of all things. By, things, by him all things hold together, is what, what, what it's being said here. And the idea that when he was a babe, he was still holding all things together. That just amazes me, Right? Notice how he didn't, it's not just that he was God, he was also very much involved in our lives. And verse 18 says uh, another uh, statement about him. In fact, there are, there are two statements here again in another uh, series of uh, phrases explaining them. First statement is that he is the head of the body, the body being the church. Now, this is a precious thought to me. Do you see any headless bodies running around? Do you see any heads without bodies laying around? Well, maybe that could be possible, but not very healthy for the individual, right? The point I'm trying to make is this is referring to how he is very much united to his people. He is one with us. And we know from the rest of scripture that that primarily happened as he came and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. But there's eyewitness testimony that we have in scripture because they beheld him, the truth which was from the beginning. And it's him they preach as they experienced life with him and that the body of people that is called together, this is, this is us as a group of people, this is us as a community of people, look to him as our leader. 
I may have a leadership role in Cornerstone Baptist Church, but I hope you recognize that all I'm doing is pointing the direction that has already been laid out for us. And that it's truly God himself, Jesus, the Son of God, who has given us the blueprint for what we are to do and how we're to do it as his people. Notice how it goes on to say another statement. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The word the beginning can be understood in several ways. Could mean that he's the first cause. No, that wouldn't be far fetched. He's the first cause of all creation. Why wouldn't he be the first cause of the church? Right? I mean, would there be a church apart from Jesus Christ? Isn't he the author and finisher of our faith? It could also be understood as he is the ruler. Right? The the archons were the, the, the ones with authority, and this word arche is is essentially talking about headship. So how do we understand headship is very important. It'll help us to make some decisions about not only this passage, but other passages in Colossians. I submit to you that I think this is speaking of his authority. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Remember, the there have been people who had died already before Christ died, right? So this must be talking about his preeminence among those who have died, which means he must have been alive, right, to have died, and that his death and his personhood is remaining preeminent among even this group of people. And so what, what is the purpose Again, so that in all things he might have the preeminence, both in the life-giving aspect of existence as well as in death. That both in the physical realm as well as the spiritual realm he might have preeminence. And so when we look at all of this, what Paul is saying is that he is very much aware of what it's like to experience death. He's preeminent in that as well. If you think about this for a moment, and Jesus Christ on the cross died a real bodily death. He didn't faint. He didn't swoon. He experienced death for us. He died a real death. And so what is it that we can understand about this death is that, well, even in death, he's still preeminent because his death is effective in accomplishing things no one else could. Right? I can die, but I can't die in your place. I can die, but I'm not going to pay for your sins. Only Christ could do that. Why? Well, because he is truly God. And experienced death truly as a human being. Verse 19 is a challenge for translators. It's... Uh, the King, the King James translators, I'm sure, had a long conversation about this particular verse. Uh, I think that they've captured the meaning well, but I would submit to you the word father is not in the Greek. That's why you may have it in italics. Uh, if, if your copy of the King James Bible is like mine, anytime you have anything in italics means that it's, it's, it's an interpretive translation. It's something that's added to bring clarity to what the author intended to communicate according to the understanding of the uh, translators. And so I think that they captured the spirit of that verse well. 
It says, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The reason why they added the words the Father is because there's no subject for the verb it pleased. Right? So what is going on here? It, it's, it's essentially answering both Greek dualism and Jewish monotheism, saying, no, this person who was very much the creator and apart from creation, who was also the head of the people of God today, the manifestation of God's people, the church, and who experienced a physical death, this person is such, in, in verse 18, uh, is is talking about I believe his 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 dwelling among us his tabernacling among us, and the point is that look the fullness of God. Right or the the fullness as it says that the, the it it literally reads because in him, it was pleased all the fullness to dwell, right and so the focus is in him. Uh, that's that's by order of priority in the Greek. In him, talking about the person, everything dwelt. And I believe it's both the divine and human nature was in one person. Why is that important? Well, because no one other than a holy God could pay or could live a sinless life to pay for my sin. Because anyone who is not obedient, anyone who has inherited sin nature would then have to pay for their own sins, right? Think about the high priest from the beginning of the days in the wilderness, in the tabernacle, that they had to go through the process of presenting God with a sacrifice for their own sins before they could then represent the people and perform the ritual to atone for the sins of the people. See, Jesus never had to do that because he himself was God. He himself was holy, is holy and perfect and completely righteous. His death was not deserved. Technically speaking, well, let's not let's not get too far down that road. But he is an eternal person, both in his divinity as well as in his humanity. And if you have a hard time with that, just think about this for a moment. What kind of bodies will we inherit in glory? They're not going to be angelic bodies. They're going to be human bodies. They're going to be glorified human bodies. Emphasis on the word glorified. And that's why I kid around about being taller and handsomer in heaven. But the idea is that here we have the two natures, both the spiritual and physical nature in perfect harmony. And I think that's what is trying is, is being communicated by the word pleased. There's no division. There's no conflict between a physical existence and a spiritual existence. There's no conflict between a physical realm that is pure because it can be. God created all things. He created human beings. He created the physical world and what does he say at the end of his creation in the sixth day and he saw that it was good and then he rested on the seventh day. So if God thinks that all of his creation is good, that means that there is a way in which we can exist as human beings and still be what? Someday, in the future, we'll be good. We know we're not that now. Amen? That's why something had to take place. But it's this person who accomplished it. 
But the thing is that both the physical and divine nature were in harmony in this one person. There was no conflict. He didn't have two personalities. He was one person having both uh, God's nature as well as human nature. And that is why he can say in verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Uh, God is at work of reconciling creation to himself. Now, I would submit to you this. Not every human being is going to be reconciled to God. But there are people who will be. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Those aren't metaphors for a new spiritual reality. No, that's a real physical existence in the presence of God. And that these new heavens and new earth and the people who are being redeemed and reconciled to God are going to stand in his presence eternally, being in harmony with him It's, it's impossible to hold on to that if we say that physical existence is evil and spiritual is good and we, we long to, to do away with all of the physical things. Well, number one, that's, that's saying that God can't create something good that's physical and material. That's nonsense. And, and saying that there's never a hope of us ever being fully good in the sense of being human and fully good. So God must have created something flawed and irreconcilable to himself to begin with. That's not the case. The fact is that we'll exist as individuals within the context of a community of redeemed people in the presence of the Son and the Father and the Spirit. So in the presence of God one day, we will exist as a community of believers. And that community is going to consist of individuals who have been redeemed, restored, and reconciled, as it says here, through the blood of his cross, by the, by the very life he gave on the cross. And notice how verse 20 ends. It says, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. If you go back to the first mention of things in earth and things in heaven, you'll see that it's talking everything, that which is visible and invisible. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's an aspect of creation, it's going to be made right. And it's going to exist in a state of harmony with the Father. And so why is it important that we hold to these truths? How can we justify our position that there is a, 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 a triune God and that the person of the Son is the very person who came and dwelt among us, not only being God himself as the eternal preexisting creator, but also as a, a human being who suffered and died and was buried and rose again on the third day in fulfillment of the scriptures. Is Christianity contradicting itself? Are we misrepresenting God? The answer to that is absolutely not. Because according to God, it's the only way that he could re reconcile the world to himself and satisfy not only his justice, but also to demonstrate his love and mercy. What greatest demonstration of love is that God became a man. He humbled himself and then chose to give himself in our place. If you keep these truths near and dear to your heart, when someone begins to talk to you about the Lord Jesus and they deny his divine nature or his humanity or the fact that he is truly 
one person with two natures, you'll be able to understand, no, the Bible teaches these things, and you can bring them right here and say, how could you explain these things apart from this one conclusion? Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Fully God, fully human. Having those two natures and still being one person. Much of the history of this doctrine can be concluded by that statement. He is the head of the church, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might be preeminent. And it's very important for us if we're going to understand the gospel, we have to have the right Jesus. And if we deny the, the Jesus of the Bible, we deny the gospel of the Bible. And so praise the Lord that we have this truth. Amen. Lots to meditate on. There is concrete biblical evidence that points to this reality. The men at the Council of Nicaea and, and, and the Council of Chalcedon and, 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 and all of the other councils that that spoke on this issue went to the scriptures and they found these things to be taught by God himself this is divine revelation that Jesus truly is the son of God he is fully human fully God and yet one person and we can bank on that amen in fact we must count on that truth if we're to believe the gospel is going to be effective for the deliverance of our souls Heavenly Father we thank you so much for this passage of scripture and its truth about the Lord Jesus Christ we thank you so much that uh, you sent your son and Lord Jesus we thank you that you have come you have served you have loved us completely and have given us life in you and we can trust that you're able to do so because you are the creator of all things at the same time you're not only are you our creator but you're also our redeemer we praise you for this and thank you in jesus name amen Closing hymn tonight is number 195. 195, God rest ye merry gentlemen. Let's stand together. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan. shepherds brought tidings of the same how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name oh tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy oh tidings of comfort and joy fear not then said the angel let nothing you affright this day is born a Savior Love and brotherhood each 
that we find within it. We're thankful, Lord, that we celebrate the birth of our Savior, the birth of, a, of, of God, Lord, that we, he always existed, he always will exist, he holds all things together, but yet he also has a love for his people, a love for us as individuals. We're so thankful for that tonight and the joy that can be ours in knowing that you put together a plan for us to be able to be called the sons of God and to be saved and to be part of your church. Now, Lord, we pray tonight that you'd give us safe journeys back to our homes. We pray that you would dismiss us with thy blessing, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.